hey, guess what? We have more beard oil. We actually just came out with a scent called UFO. Go check it out on the confessionalspodcast.com. Hit the store page. It's right there. Click on the purchase button if you want to get it. It smells like a smooth, heavenly, fruity scent. Sweet. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long, bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave, and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. But the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand, and he's running really fast. And spears... Dan it holds him up like this. Somebody else shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section. You can reach us that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. If you want to hear more shows every week, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the join button and become a member today to the website because you will get an extra show every Thursday and you'll be able to binge on all the previous episodes we've come out with and you'll be able to hear all the future episodes that we do come out with. And if you ever envision yourself getting in a bind where you live in an area with a lot of tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, or simply the supply chain gets cut off, you might want to think about getting some emergency preparedness food. And we do offer that at preparewiththeconfessionals.com. So if that interests you, go to preparewiththeconfessionals.com and you'll be able to get emergency preparedness food. We offer a one month supply and a one week supply. And if you get the one month supply, we'll knock a hundred dollars off for you right there. Now, this This week, we have Jason and Amy coming on the show. They're a married couple, and Jason had an experience that many people hear about, but most people can't envision actually happening to them, and that's Jason died. He was dead for about 30 to 45 minutes, and while he was dead, he went to hell, he went to heaven, and now he's back. So we're going to bring on Jason and Amy to share this incredible story right now. All right, today we got a great guest coming on. Actually, we have two guests coming on. We have Amy and Jason. How are y'all doing? Doing well. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, you guys are a married couple. And Amy, you reached out to us and told us about an exceptional story, really, about your husband and how he... He literally beat death, and I find that <laughs> I find that very interesting. And it's something that uh, really is is not an under description either. It's not an over description, I should say. Uh, it's very accurate. So, Jason or Amy, however you guys would like to do this, um, start us off with you know where were you, uh, what were you doing that kind of led to this event happening in the first place? Well, I was uh, born. I was actually born in Pennsylvania, where you're at. Um, but I was born with the disease called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which means my body doesn't produce salt. So I can get severely dehydrated very fast. And, uh, we were going out, uh, Christmas shopping and we stopped at a, a local subway and, um, 
we ate before we went out Christmas shopping. And um, it was December of 2016. And then it was about three o'clock in the morning. He woke up um, severely sick and couldn't keep anything down. <clears throat> and now the whole time we've known each other since third grade. And then we got married. Um, well, this year it's, uh, it'll be 14 years this year. Awesome. Um, and, uh, and the whole time I've known him, I've never known him to get food poisoning like this or to have any kind of sickness like that would cause him to throw up a lot and all that other stuff. So honestly, I didn't really think anything of it. I was like, Oh, you're sick, you know? And I tried taking care of him, making sure he got fluids and stuff. I didn't realize I kind of did cause I knew he had this disease, but I guess because we never experienced anything like this, death really wasn't on my mind. I, I just thought, you know, I would get him better. And if he wasn't getting any better, I'd take him to the hospital and they would pump him through with fluids and he'd be fine. But by, um, it was a Friday night that we went and by four o'clock Sunday morning, he was delirious. He was screaming that he was in a lot of pain. And so I helped him get dressed and we got into the car and I took, started driving to the hospital, and he started breathing really rapidly. Like, I've never heard someone breathe like this before. I, so I looked over at him, and he was just, like, moaning and breathing so fast. And I was like, what's wrong with you? And he wouldn't respond to me. His eyes were open, but it's like he wasn't there. And I started, you know, smacking on him and yelling at him. And then I said, I, I've got to call 911. I don't know what's going on. So I, I called 911 and they told me to pull over. And um, before they even got there, I knew that he died right there in the car with me because I seen him take his last breath. <clears throat> and the thing about when someone died, this I've never experienced this before. And, you know, when you see it in the movies, it's completely different than your loved one dying in front of you. Um, you know, some people say, well, why didn't you try to do CPR? I, I was hysterical. I didn't know what to do. All I could think of is, oh my God, he's dead. How is this happening? And when he took his last breath, it, the thing that stuck in my mind the longest was his tongue came out and he just, he wasn't there anymore. And then the cops showed up first, then the EMTs. And they took me and put me in the back of a cop car so they could work on him. And the police called my parents, which live in the same town. And they showed up. And it took them about 30 minutes before they could finally get his heart beating again. And so his brain was without oxygen or blood for, I would probably say, maybe 33 minutes. You know, given the time it takes from him dying and then actually getting there. And then we got to the hospital and they told us that. They had him stabilized, but he had no brain activity. And they were life flighting him to Vanderbilt, which is um, a popular hospital in Nashville. Because where we live in Clarksville, we only have one hospital, and it's, it's not the best. So when we get to Vanderbilt, and they told me um, that they did everything they could, but that they didn't expect him to live. Because all the tests they had run and everything they were trying to do for him, his brain was not showing any activity whatsoever. And they told me to prepare for him not to make it. And it was, you know, it was awful. And I have two daughters and they were at home um, at the time. One was 16, the other one was 13. And they had no idea what had happened because they were asleep when we left. So I have an older sister that lives here in town. Um, she went to the house and she, you know, told them what happened and brought them up there. And this was like a couple hours later. And by this time, most of my family and stuff are there with us and um, he's in the ICU. And they told us to hold his hand and to talk to him, you know, so we were doing that and they kept saying, you know, try to get him to squeeze your hand or do something 
to let people know that he's actually there. And, but he hadn't been responding to anything. My daughters get there and they were very upset. And um, my oldest daughter, I don't know. I don't know why she's, <laughs> both my daughters are different than most, but when she was younger, she looked at me, I think when she was like three or four and said, mama, I don't know what love you means. And ever since then, she would never say it. She would write it on stuff, but she would never say it to anybody. Well, she got up there and she grabbed his hand and she said, Jason, it's Audrey. I love you. And immediately his head jerked and he squeezed her hand and everybody was going crazy. And um, they told everybody to get out of the room because they wanted to do more testing and stuff. And he finally <clears throat> started reacting to the tests. And so we had hope. And um, then after about a, a couple of days, they did some brain scans and everything. And they came and told me that even though he was showing signs of improvement, he would probably not live a meaningful life because he had such severe damage done to his brain. Um, it was the frontal lobe. And I was really upset. That was the worst day for me, I think, because I felt like, you know, God, why, why would we go through this and why bring him back if he's just going to be a vegetable? And, um, thankfully I had so many family and just people I didn't even know reaching out to me on Facebook and everything, praying for us and just loving on us. And I think it was their faith that got me through that because my faith was in shambles at the time. And yeah. then, um, I'll, I'll start with my story. Um, the last thing I remember was my wife screaming at me for me to uh, say something. And immediately after she was screaming at me, my body, my, my spirit fell out of my body and I started free falling. And, um, it was a, it was like a long fall, but it, it, it was so fast. Like I've never um, jumped out of a plane and free fall, but I would think that that's how it was. And immediately, I was in hell because <clears throat> when you're dead, the spirit, the spirit world in your spirit it, it's you know who you're face to face with you know exactly what's going on um you're more live you're more alive than you hear than you are here on earth um it's that world is so more real than it is here and you feel so much more than you feel here um I was I was in hell. I was right next to the lake of fire. Um, I was face to face with Satan, and you know you see pictures of Satan with having horns and all this stuff. You know the Bible depicts him as the most beautiful angel, and he looked like a regular person, but I felt in my spirit the evil i mean just complete evil and i i knew he wanted to get to me to torture me um it's when i was in hell he was accusing me of a bunch of stuff you know when i was before i found the lord jesus you know i was i was searching i i was doing all kinds of drugs when i ran into my wife um, my dad was in the military and, um, we moved, I moved back to Clarksville and I started running around some of my old friends. And <laughs> when I ran into my wife, she wasn't my wife yet, but I was high on cocaine and drunk and, uh, you, but I was searching if there was something else out there. Because I felt so empty and I thought of suicide and all kinds of stuff. And then 
um, I ran into her and she was already uh, going to church and stuff. And I always wanted to date her through high school and stuff, but uh, I was always a player. So she never would, you know, give me the time of day. And uh, she said, if you want to date with date me, then you got to stop all this stupid crap that you're doing right now. So that night I went home and I flushed all my drugs down the toilet and I've been clean ever since. Um, But um, the. The evil, the evil I felt, there's evil people on this earth, but the evil I felt in in hell, it doesn't even come close. Um, You know, uh, everything, it's like a telepathic. um, It was everything I did in my life was up in my head. He showed me everything I did bad in my life. Satan did. Um, I didn't want to look at him because the evil and he was trying to get to me and he couldn't get to me because he knew I was being protected. And I was looking around by the lake of fire and I've seen millions of people in the lake of fire, millions. And I've seen famous people. I've seen pastors in the lake of fire, but they had no names. You have no identity in hell. You just know what they did here on earth. And um, it really bothered me that I seen pastors in the lake of fire. But um, I remembered the scripture that you'll be held to a higher accountability if you lead my people astray. And um, I seen thousands of demons just crawling everywhere and they were all grotesque and deformed and and uh the the thing that i was thinking was why am i in hell i I used to be an assistant pastor and i used to preach the word why am i in hell and that really bothered me for a long time and i didn't want to talk about going to hell because it's so it it terrified terrified me so much that it was hard for me (coughs) to talk about it. And uh, eventually, you know, I started telling my wife that I went to hell. But after a while in hell, all of a sudden, like a light came down around me and I started going up so fast, like I was lifted up like the speed of light. And I, I was in a brilliant brilliant light and i was going up so fast and uh but the light was alive and it was so loving and so so different than being in hell and all of a sudden i i was in heaven and like i said when when you're dead your spirit your spirit, the spirit world is so much more real than here. I knew I was in heaven and um, I was in a meadow and that meadow had a stream. It had thousands of flowers. The stream was alive. Everything in heaven was alive. And uh, the flowers were all alive. The colors on the flowers it's colors i've never seen here on earth never and the colors like i say when everything's head in is in heaven is alive the colors were even alive you know your spirit knows automatically know that colors were alive even the flowers were alive um i I uh, come across um, my old Rottweiler that I had to put down. And uh, I don't remember the conversation we had, but we had a conversation. (laughs) I talked to my dog and it it just blew my, 
blew my mind. So, Jason, one second. So you literally had like a, a true conversation with dog. It wasn't like you were just talking to dog and the dog's looking at you with like you know, a dog look, but he actually spoke back with you? Yeah, yeah. It was all up in, the, up in your head. Like the only audible world, word that was ever spoken to me was when Jesus told me I was forgiven. But yeah, I had, wow. a, I can't remember the converse, the full conversation of my dog, but we had a conversation and, um, it was like mind speak. It was like a mind speak. Yeah. Okay. And, but you can also speak, you know, audibly speak also, but, um, it, it was like, I could see 360 all around me. Like I knew what was behind me, on the side of me, in front of me. It just you. It's automatic. You know exactly, you know where everything's at. And um, when Jesus said I was forgiven, like um, even the water in that stream, hands came out of that water and started praising. Um, the flowers even got louder when he said I was forgiven, but, uh, it, it so much went on that I was trying to take in everything and everything's coming at you so, so fast. Um, when I was speaking to my dog, I looked up and I seen <clears throat> Jesus approaching me. And I knew it was Jesus because when you're dead, you know who you're face to face with. Um, he had um, have what what movie was that from? Um, heaven is for real. Heaven is for real. That little boy that went to heaven, and the little girl that painted the picture of Jesus. Um, that is what Jesus looked like. He, he, you know, he had, he didn't have white, white skin. He had, you know, he was from Israel. He's an Israelite. Um, dark complexion. Yeah. He had a dark complexion and, uh, he had light blue eyes, the light blue eyes. It was, his eyes were so piercing, but so, so loving. And like, in heaven, you're consumed by love. I mean, you just feel it in your spirit and it consumes you so much. Just like uh, in hell, um, the darkness consumes you. You can't even see your fingers in front of your face and the darkness consumes you. But in heaven, the love consumes you. And I felt it and um we were having a conversation um you, he told me i needed to come back because he knew i didn't want to come back to the earth because i knew what i was coming back to i was coming back to an earth that people were fighting and killing people and um arguing and so much evil here on earth and I didn't want to come back to that after feeling all that love that I felt. I knew what I was going to come back to, but at that moment, I didn't have any memory of my wife or my daughters, but, um, he, uh, he showed me the, um, nail marks on his hands. And he told me I did this for you and everybody else on this earth, on that earth. He said, you need to go back and tell people why I died, why I, you know, I died for them and um, that I'm coming back soon. And uh, he knew uh, what I went through in hell. And uh, the only audible word that he told me, he said, you're forgiven. And when he spoke that word, 
the angels in heaven, um, the colors, the flowers, even my dog, the singing just got so, so loud, but it didn't hurt your ears. Um, you know, the whole time it was, I, all I heard was just music and it's the most beautiful music I've ever heard in my life. And it was so soothing. I knew the music was in every language on this earth, but I can only understand the English. But I also knew that like the spirit world is so much more real. I knew it was being sung at the same time in every language that because there's people every, everywhere on this earth that is in heaven. And, you know, it, it just, it blew my mind that I knew every language in those songs was in those songs at the very same time. And it's, um, I didn't want to come back. You know, um, when I was a child, I used to have seizures. And one time um, I was in the emergency room and I left my body and I was hovering over my body. And uh, I seen um, my guardian angel. And every once in a while, when I was little, I would see that guardian angel over, over me, looking over me. And when I was walking down the road one time, this lady come running out, screaming at me, saying, there's angels all around you. There's angels all around you. And I told her, I said, I know I see them all the time. And uh, but. Um, yeah, it's um, that's pretty much uh, my story there. No, we're not done yet. I, <laughs> you're not going to just leave me in heaven here, buddy. We got, <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to start off with, uh, all right. So you're in heaven. You're having a conversation with Jesus. You say he looked like the Jesus from the movie, uh, heaven is for real. And, uh, I've, you know, like I say a million times on the show, I don't watch movies. And so I never saw the movie. I just looked up the painting, I guess. And is that, I'm assuming the person that you're talking about here? The, yes. The common. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, he's a good looking guy. So, you know, I, I mean, it, 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 how, how like accurate is this? Like, I mean, if you, if you say, I mean, he looked like the painting, are you saying like identical or is it like the eyes that look the same or what? It's, it, it's identical. It's identical. Okay. Yeah. It, it's um, like it makes it made sense to me because um, no, <laughs> um, yeah, that he, that he has light blue eyes because all the Israelites uh, normally had dark eyes and. He, I've always thought that Jesus had blue eyes because uh, <clears throat> I had done a Bible study one time where um, it talked about Rachel and Lee and how the description of her was that she had weak eyes. And one of the studies said how what it might have meant was that she had blue eyes because back then they saw blue eyes as a deformity. <clears throat> they didn't see it as something pretty. and in the Bible, it also describes Jesus as, you know, he wasn't uh, attractive to the other people, basically saying he was, you know, unattractive and ugly. And I always thought, then he must have had blue eyes. And um, then when Jason, you know, was telling me that, I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, so I, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I don't ever, um, I never knew that. I never knew that about the... Uh... The deformity that they thought was with the blue eyes. So that's really interesting. Um, okay, so you're in heaven. Everything's alive. You see Jesus. You talk with Jesus. What was the reason? Like, do you have any idea why you fell to hell before ascending to heaven? 
Yes. Um, I believe Jesus wanted me to actually see that there is consequences if they don't follow him, if they don't have a relationship. Uh, Jesus told me the most important thing is a relationship with me. And, uh, you know, there's so, when I seen that pastor in the lake of fire, it's there's so many people that go to church every Sunday and Wednesday and they think they're doing their thing and they don't even know them. They never even speak to them yeah. or nothing. And, uh, you know, he said, the most important thing is a relationship with me and I'm coming back soon. So, so, I mean, that kind of goes, you know, it goes with what the Bible tells us, you know, when it comes to, uh, salvation, you know, it, it's, it's about Jesus and it's not only confessing with your mouth, but believing in your heart and with the believing in your heart, it's, you know, if you truly believe in your heart, there is a relationship that follows from that belief. And so, uh, that, that's really interesting. And, um, okay. So I, I'm trying to wrap my mind around all this stuff here because <laughs> I, 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 it's I not easy. I'm trying to think, if, I don't even think I've ever had anybody on the show. I've had somebody on the show that has had a near death experience. They died, came back, told me what they saw, but, they this is not that this is this is so wow okay so you're in heaven let's not even let's not even get out of heaven yet let's just stay there for a while and let it, <laughs> let it marinate <laughs> so you're you're in heaven everything yeah. everything around you is alive and loving and when you were describing this environment you were in and then seeing Christ come walking towards you and having that interaction. I'm sitting here and I'm looking at this painting that you said that he looked like when you were describing that. And I just was, I, I felt like I, like I was looking into the eyes of God <laughs> like when I was looking at this painting because of what you had said. And um, all right. So the dog, let's get back to the talk here. What do, what do you think about this this idea then all right so you you see the dog you you have a conversation with the dog in heaven you knew the dog because it was your dog this is a question that i'm going to i personally not to be mean or anything i personally don't really care but there's a lot of people that are going to want this question answered yeah do all dogs go to heaven you know like <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like people love their pets, right? And so pets, yeah. like dogs, cats, they, they, it's not like a matter of sin. It's not a matter of, you know, accepting Christ as their savior. Uh, that's a human thing. And so if that's the case, then do you personally feel that uh, people are people's pets are going to be there waiting for them when they get to heaven? Or do you think this was an exceptional uh, or something that was an exception where it, you were allowed to see your dog because of some reason? I I don't have the answer. I don't know if every animal goes to heaven. I, I he just allowed me to see my dog um because I was tore up when I had to put her down. Um I didn't see any other animals. Um um I had I just had a small glimpse small glimpse of heaven i wasn't like in i didn't walk down the um golden path or anything else that you read about in the bible i didn't see any uh, any mansions i didn't see any of that stuff he just allowed me to see my dog i don't i didn't see anything i didn't see any other animals um but I've seen, you know, thousands of angels and, um, the, it's, um, like I said, when I was younger, I, I seen my guardian angel a few times, but, uh, yeah, I've seen, I don't know about anybody else's animals or, anything else um you know my father passed away before this happened I, I didn't have an encounter with my father 
or nothing like that. But, um, he, he just allowed me to see, um, you know, my dog. Okay. Yeah. I, I just wanted to make sure I remember to ask that because I knew if I didn't ask it, I was going to get some emails about it because people want to know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, I think they are, I think, I think they are, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, listen, like I said, for me, I, I just don't care either way. Like, I mean, I love my pets now and stuff, but I just, I, for me, I imagine like if I'm in heaven, I'm going to have a lot more things on my mind other than a dog that I once knew. So, uh, that's just how I view it and stuff. But, um, of course I'm mean to people tell me so, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, no. All right. So gosh, I feel like there's a million questions I should be asking right now with this. Um, you're all right. Being in heaven, you didn't see the mansions. You didn't see, you didn't, you said you didn't walk down the golden road. Did you see the golden road? No, I, I was just in this meadow. So you're just in like a meadow that was like a holding place for you. Yeah. Yeah. And like, um, you know, like I said, when I, I used to be an assistant pastor and, you know, I'd have doubts and all this stuff. And I never understood omnipresent, like how Jesus could be everywhere at the same time. Well, I got that answered. Um, when I was face to face with Jesus, <clears throat> I also knew he was with a thousand other people at the very same time, having another conversation with them. It like I was face to face with them, but I also knew he was in other places at the very same time. And I seen it happen and it still blows my mind. And how do you, how do you, yeah, how do you put that in words? And it's, uh, you can't, you can't put that in words. Yeah, no, you, you can't. And it's even like the idea of the Holy Trinity. I just had somebody email me asking me about my thoughts on the Holy Trinity and how do I understand it. And I'm just like, I, I, I really don't understand it. You know, it, it's it, I don't know how to tell you other than it, the simple explanation of it's it's God three in one, literally God three in one. And I don't understand past that. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to fathom. And like what you just described about being you know, in all places at one time, uh, and, and holding com- communication with people in all places at one time. Uh, it's man. So th- like th- this education that you got, this information you got, like this, what you just shared with the omnipresence, it, that's something that like, it's not like he stood there and told you, but it's just something that like you just understood because I guess the was it the I, I feel like saying the environment is like understating it but like it's like you're in heaven it's a whole new realm it's a spiritual realm it's a it's it's just not this reality that we're accustomed to and i guess that's how you understood it i think it's because <clears throat> you know in the spiritual world and the spiritual realm there's no limits there's no physical limits because there's no body, you don't have a finite mind and brain. It's, you know, it's almost like an automatic download. And it's just like he just, the information just comes to you. And like when he first got there, it was so overwhelming because it was just so much. Because it was just, you know, knowing everything right at that second. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's, let's, uh, let's kind of rewind here a little bit. Uh, when you were in hell, uh, I guess, you know what, let me ask you this before we even get to that point from the time that you, you had died and you fell and you felt yourself falling and you fell into hell, uh, to the time that you were brought back, how long did it feel like that for you, Jason? I mean, people are saying that, you know, it's 30, 33 minutes, but for you, what you just described to me, it it must've felt longer than 30 minutes. It did. It did it, like there's there's not a clock in heaven and there's no clock in hell and it, there's there's no time when you're dead and it felt 
a whole lot longer, especially um, when I was in hell. It, it felt, it already felt like an eternity um, because I thought I was going to be there for eternity. I, I never, you know, I didn't think I was going to get out of there. And, uh, and then same thing in heaven. It, it was, it was, it seemed faster in heaven because it, I didn't want to leave. Yeah. It wasn't long enough, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, I, I told Jesus I didn't want to come back and I was like, I don't want to come back. I don't want to go back. And he told me, he said, I, I've, I've got a mission for you. You got to go back and tell people what you've seen and what you experienced because I'm coming back soon. But uh, heaven wasn't long enough <laughs> for me. Yeah. You know, because I, I just had a glimpse of heaven. And, you know, like I said, I was just in that meadow. I didn't see anything else. And, uh, I know there's so much more, <laughs> you know, and, and I didn't see everything like some other people that I've read stories about, you know, that they were actually walking down the street and stuff. Uh, I was just in this meadow. That's all I went to. So, yeah, I can understand though. I mean, when you're having a good time, it always goes by fast, right? And yeah, so, yeah. You know, I, I'm glad that you know heaven would be eternity because it would take eternity to even try to fathom and get used to the idea of what you're experiencing. Um, so, all right, we're gonna remind me. We're gonna get back to this this idea of why you were brought back. Um, but before we do that, we're you're in hell, and you said that. Uh, it had already felt like an eternity when you were there, which is extremely, incredibly descriptive. Uh, when you said that, it gave me it gave me shivers, and uh, it, it, the idea that you were you were there for such a brief period of time, yet you equate it to being there for eternity, uh, tells me how uh, how ugh, not I don't even know I don't even have the words to describe. Um, what that is like it, it's just it's terrifying yeah. uh, but you're down there and you come face to face with satan um he looks like a, a human right is that what you said yeah yeah okay uh and you know like you said the bible describes him as the most beautiful angel so uh he, I, you can only imagine what he looked like standing in front of you uh, the lake of fire, the people inside of it. Uh, was this lake of fire something that was seemingly uh, in a central location or was it like something that you looked out at and you just couldn't see the end of it? It was just like, and, and was it truly fire? Was it like truly fire, like a, a giant fire area? Is that what you mean by lake of fire? Yeah, yeah, it was, it, it looked, like it was it went on for a long time um you know there were people it, it really tears me up because the people in the lake of fire they knew i was being protected and they were screaming at me for me to help them because what i seen they were burning and burning and burning and burning and they would never die and uh like i said the your the spirit world is so much more real and um you know it, it uh it still affects me today because those people are going to be there for the rest of their for 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 eternity and uh <clears throat> i wanted i wanted to help them i wanted to help them and get them out of there but you know, the, the decision, when that decision is made, that decision is final. And, um, um, you know, uh, it's, um, it, 
the lake of fire is yeah it, it's it's uh it's fire it's you know it's like when you walk in and when you're having a campfire or something and somebody walks in and they start burning to death it's just like that but it never never ends it's just continuously and um um i heard demons torturing other people but i didn't see that because i was so fixated on the people in the lake of fire but i see i heard people screaming at me and and just i knew i knew that they were being tortured then there's other ways to be tortured in hell than just the lake of fire but um i didn't want to look at all that stuff it, it it uh it terrified me it's uh you know i'm afraid of heights but the terror in hell it, it indescribable it's indescribable i'll tell you when he first <clears throat> started coming around and and talking about this um we had been in the hospital over a month at this time and he still you know today you can tell he still has a hard time speaking sometimes and he couldn't really talk that well at first he had we had to go through rehab and he had to learn how to do everything again walking talking i mean he was like a newborn baby when he came back and um we had been there for a month and uh this one the pastor that had married us had come to visit him and he prayed over jason and he told jason before he left he said I know you saw something. I know something happened to you and I want to hear about it when you can tell me. And he left and Jason looked at me and he just got this terrified look on his face and he started crying and he started balling up into like the fetal position. He's like, no, I don't want to tell. I don't want to tell. I don't want to go back there. Don't make me go back there. And I was like, I had to calm him down. And for a long time, he wouldn't talk about it. I had just had to give him his space and time for him to be able to get through it and then be ready to talk about it. Wow. So Jason was not Jason when you brought him home or when he came back. He he had brain damage is what you're describing, right? Yes, he had very a lot of brain damage. It was like uh right through the middle and to the front part and the frontal lobe of his brain when they showed me the scans um the damaged part was like white compared to it was like a discoloration on the scan and it was basically all through the middle and the front part of his brain and it was due to the lack of oxygen and blood so i mean he you know he wasn't jason at first um it was like i had another child i had to take care of i had to bathe him and clothe him. I had to feed him. I, you know, I had it. And for me, it was like, I, uh, it was really hard for me because for me, I had to grieve. I felt like I grieved the loss of my husband because he came, but he's a different person now. He's, and, I, and there's a lot of things I love better, <laughs> but of course, <laughs> I mean, he's, he's still Jason, but he's different in a lot of ways because it changed him a lot. I know, I can tell you we've argued maybe once since all this happened and it was this past December was three years. It's brought us closer together, definitely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It um it changed my whole life. Um I'm like a half a semester away from a four year degree and I used to counsel children. And uh, I used to be a wrestling coach. Um, you know, I, I used to be able to do all kinds of stuff before all this. Um, but now I got to carry cards in my wallet to show me what the numbers and letters look like. Um, because I can't recall what they look like until they're in front of me. Um, I've got a minor in math and I can barely count 
on my fingers. I can't add on my fingers hardly. Um, you know, math used to just come so easy to me. And I used to help my daughters <coughs> going through school, you know, and, and teaching them, you know, math and stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I lost all that. I can't remember hardly anything from college, you know, learning anything from college. Um, my doctor said that knowledge is still there. It's just hard for you to recall it. And, um, you know, uh, the rehab, you know, um, relearning how to walk, relearning how to talk. Um, I remember in rehab, um, I didn't know what the colors were called, you know, whether it's orange or blue or green. Um, I, I just looked at it like it was Chinese to me. Um, and, um, you know, th things that you take for granted and then it's taken away from you. It's, um, it, it's, uh, difficult. Your, your whole life is changed in an instant. Mm -hmm. And, um, We've lost a lot of friends because of it. Yeah, we've lost a lot of friends and things. And, you know, through this whole thing, you know, being in the hospital so long, you know, our house went on foreclosure and we had a bunch of friends get together and have a yard sale to get our house out of foreclosure. Um, you know, because when you're living your life, you don't think about things like that. So, you know, we would have, we had a small savings, but, um, that all. Because at the time I was a stay at home mother and I didn't have a job. We relied totally on Jason's job. Yeah. And I used to make quite a bit of money at my job. And, and, uh, and then now I'm still at the same company, but I had a huge pay cut because I can't do what I used to be able to do. And, um, so it's a whole life change and it gave me more compassion with people with disabilities. It, um, you know, I used to get frustrated with people that were slow and wouldn't get out of the way and things like that. And now it, it, it it's like, I know, I understand what they're going through, you know, and, and, uh, it's, uh. I'm happy that it happened to me, though, because I used to have a really, really bad temper. And that's pretty much non-existent now. And I still get <laughs> still get frustrated because I remember everything I used to be able to do. And when I tried to do something that I used to be able to do and I can't do it anymore, it's frustrating. Um, my my daughter that I taught how to ride her bike, she taught me how to ride the bike when I got out of the hospital. And, and it's, a, you know, a complete circle, you know, my daughter teaching me how to ride a bike. And uh, it, I laugh about that now. You know, you got to have a sense of humor because if you don't have a sense of humor, Man, so many people with uh, my type of brain injury, a lot of them um, commit suicide or or uh, get very depressed. And and uh, <coughs> you just I can't let that happen. You know, I, I got to keep going forward, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, I think some people might react a little different um, and. You know, it doesn't sound like you have any resentment. And I, I, I was wondering, because, you know, some people might be resentful, like, okay, I died. I had a different kind of experience. I got to meet Jesus. He sent me back. And it's like, he couldn't send me back with a fully functioning brain again. I mean, <laughs> what is going on here? But it doesn't sound like you have any kind of resentment. Do you think that this is just all part of the plan? 
it's all part of the plan. Um, you know, he, he made me rely more on him than my abilities. Um, like, um, you know, I used to drive, um, big trucks, um, uh, a big old Coke truck, like a semi. And, um, you know, um, I can't pass my DOT physical anymore. Um, I lost my train of thought what I was saying, but, uh, you know, it's, um, I'm not angry about it. I'm not angry about, about it because it made me look my life differently. You know, um, what's, what used to be important in my life isn't, I realized it wasn't really important and it made me realize what was really important, you know, and, um, a lot of, you know, I've read stories about people with my type of brain injury and they're angry and upset and, you know, um, yeah, you're a different person, but, um, you know, I, I, I can't fathom going through something like that without a relationship with Jesus, because I believe my relationship with Jesus is the only reason why I am here right now as I am. Um, you know, um, a lot of people, um, gotta take the, uh, the uh, bus to go to the grocery store and stuff. And, you know, um, I've had to relearn how to drive, a car again, you know, and like I said, I used to drive a semi truck and, you know, relearning how to drive just a regular vehicle, you know, it, it was frustrating. I scared the crap out of my daughter and my wife to hope <laughs> because I kept looking down at my feet. <laughs> we had him, we had him in our neighborhood. He wanted to try it. And so I was like, all right. And so I let him get in the driver's seat and he kept looking at his feet instead of looking at where we were going. I said, no, no, we can't do this. <laughs> so I'm not dying. If you just came back. <laughs> <laughs> it's understandable. It's understandable. I mean, you just came back. You're not going anywhere anytime soon. They need to preserve that life. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, let me ask you, you know, um, how long did it take you to start remembering these details after you came back? Was this something that was immediate or was it something that was gradual over time? Like you remembered some stuff, but then as time went on, you started remembering more and more. Say that. It was more gradual. And cause uh, for a long time there, it took him a hard, it took him a hard time. It took him a long time to be able to put it into words. Because he also had um, what's called aphasia, where you know what you want to say, but you just can't get it out. And he couldn't recall the words to say what he remembered. So it took, a, it took about a year and a half before he finally could really say, this is what I saw and this is what happened. Now, Jason, when you came back, they said that, I guess at least we can say, you showed signs of life when Audrey said that she loved you. And I think you, they said that I think your wife said, Amy said that um, your hand twitched or your head moved. Um, do you recall that moment at all? Do you like, cause you kind of, you left us hanging in the meadow with Jesus. You didn't really <laughs> tell us how you came back or anything like that. I mean, do you remember coming back at all? Um, I don't remember hardly anything in my hospital stay. Um, I don't remember my daughter telling me that she loves me. Um, when, when Jesus said that I've got to come back because he's coming back soon, as soon as he said soon, it was like 
I was in my body again instantly. And, um, it's, um, it, it took me, I didn't know that I was back in my body because I was still, I was on the ventilator, you know, um, because my body wasn't breathing on itself. But, um, um, yeah, everything in the spirit world, it, it, it's almost like instantly. And, um, I don't, like I said, I don't remember hardly anything from the hospital stay. I don't remember a whole lot of people coming to see me. Um, my wife says a lot of people came to see me, um, because, um, all the stores that I used to service. He works at Frito-Lay and he used to drive a, a route and deliver to them. And so all his customers that he delivered to, they would, you know, they were worried about him. So you had people visiting you in the hospital, but you really don't remember much of that. So the whole process of you, uh, man, this is going to sound ironic almost, falling from heaven uh, to uh, waking up in the hospital to all that stuff. It's, it's kind of a foggy, cloudy memory then, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's... Um, okay. You remember bits and pieces from the hospital because you told me. Yeah, I, I, I remember beats, be, <laughs> bits and pieces. Um, um, you know, more, more than um, the rehab. Um, because when I was in ICU, I don't remember any of that. Um, because you were partially out of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I was in rehab, um, I remember, you know, a few of my friends would come and visit and I'd get so excited um, because once you're laying in the hospital bed for so long, it's like you're you're going out of your mind because you you're re, you starting to remember everything that you used to be able to do and you just want to get up and start walking yeah. and you can't because um you, with your body just doesn't remember how. Yeah, yeah my body doesn't remember how to walk <laughs> um um you know i've had a at first i started um um in a wheelchair going to rehab and stuff and um you know uh tell her tell him about the uh nurse brushing my teeth uh, yeah he was, <laughs> well, while he was in the hospital, he was, like I said, it was like, um, this one lady told me it's like a computer. She said, when a computer boots up, you know, it slowly, one section starts, then the next and the next. And then with him also, it was almost like his brain was going through a reboot, a reboot. And he was like a little kid. And the nurse would come in, they would try to brush his teeth, and he would bite down and not let them do it. Or <laughs> he pulled the tubes, the feeding tube, out of his nose. Like, he started to, and I kept telling him, no, don't do that. And he would look at me and act like he was going to do it. And I would say, no, stop. And then he reached up and yanked it out and then looked at me and smiled. And I was like, you little. Jeez, that's, that's like my two-year-old son. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and, then, and he, would, he would speak gibberish. And when he first started talking, though, it was Christmas Eve of 2016. The first words that came out of this man's mouth was he started talking like I, I, I didn't even recognize his voice. He was saying, where's my sheriff? Everybody shut the F up. And, and I said, what are you talking about? And he said how he was going to, I'm going to shoot them all up. And I said, you don't even have a gun. And he looked at me and said, shut the F up. And I mean, he was screaming this. And like the nurses had to come in and sedate him. And I'm like, I am so sorry. I don't know why he's acting. They said, well, with traumatic brain injuries, a lot of the time when they first come out of it and they start speaking, they'll use cuss words. <laughs> 
It was crazy. Well, I guess you get a pass. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I, I want to ask you, uh, you know, you, you had this experience and you remember what you remember. And what you remember is, is actually significant detail. You mentioned about how you have heard other people's similar experiences to yours. Knowing what you've been through, knowing what you heard, and you don't have to name any names, you don't have to name drop, but have you heard people that are in the public eye saying that they died, gone to heaven or hell and came back where you don't really believe them because it just doesn't seem even remotely close to what your experience was? There were, there's a lot of, uh, cause I've been listening to a lot of podcasts of people that had the same experience and, and, um, I don't know if I believe it completely because uh, some of the stuff that they've said that it, it, it doesn't mean that they didn't have their own experience, but, um, you know, I, I take it like a grain of salt. Um, well, it's just like, it's just like the whole thing with you. It's the main thing. The one of the things that most people have a hard time believing is the, is the dog part. That's where everyone's like, wait a minute. <laughs> no. Yeah. But if you knew Jason, you know, and if you were friends with him for a long time, you knew the person he was, you would know that he doesn't make this stuff up. He's not, he's, he's that's what he's experienced he is not a liar he he's never been like that um and he's never been one before this he was never like into like the supernatural stuff or anything like that he just you know he was more of a see it and believe it person you know i've always been the one that's been into that kind of stuff you know and like i would tell him stuff, you know, that I would hear about or see. And he'd be like, oh, you know, I can't believe you believe that in me, you know? <laughs> so he was more of a skeptic about stuff before this happened to him. So, all right. You mentioned earlier about how you guys even lost friends from this. Uh, that kind of caught me off guard because it's a situation where um, you would think friends would actually stick by your side going through a hard time like that. Are you meaning that what you lost friends, not during that process, but afterwards, like when you started talking about your experience? Yeah. 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 When I start talking about my experience, um, there's a lot of people, I've got a lot of friends that don't believe in Jesus so they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to hear about the consequences. Um, so it's like um, I've got a friend that his dad um, is either a pastor or, or a deacon or something, but um, he has fell away so far away from the church and um uh, he's um like he don't really want to listen to it because that would give him a smack in the face kind of thing you know um he's not at that point in his life where he's ready to have a relationship there's so many people out there that they know the truth <laughs> but they don't want to make that final decision yet. They're not ready. And, um, it's, um, it, it hurts my heart because there's like, um, when I was in hell, I was looking up and I just seen just, thousands of people dying right 
that second falling into hell. And um, it gave me more of a, an urgency to tell people, you know, it, it's um, people get all caught up on church buildings and things, but it, it, we got to realize that we're the church. We're, you know, wherever we go, we're the church. It's not a really building. Um, and uh, it gave me an urgency to share um, that there is consequences. And then, of course, you've also got people who just think that he's he just dreamt it or he, you know, and I'm like, he couldn't dream. His brain brain was dead. You know, I mean, he was your brain after six minutes. That's when it starts to die. And he was dead for more than 30 minutes and <clears throat> there was no brain activity. So he couldn't have dreamt anything. But, but you know, yeah. Well, I mean, there's always going to be people who are naysayers who don't believe uh, your story. Uh, you have to be okay with that because uh, you're not Jesus Christ, and even Jesus Christ isn't saving every single person on the earth, right? So, amen. You can't you can't uh, take it personal. Yeah. Uh, and you know, when it comes to losing friends, I mean, uh, I don't know if you lost friends that were you know Christians, Christian friends, but uh, you know, I would just point to the idea of you know, you had an experience that uh, is, you know, not typical coming back to life after 30 some minutes, then also having these memories. Um, but the memories that you have, I mean, they do line up with certain things, like even the idea of the dog talking, like you said, that kind of loses people. Well, we got talking donkeys in the Bible, <laughs> you know, like, that's true. You got, you got, I think it's uh, Numbers chapter 22, if I recall correctly. Uh, it's Balaam and his talking donkey. And, you know, he's beating the donkey and the donkey's arguing back and they're going back and forth and stuff. And it's just like, you know, it's, it's there. It's there. I mean, you have to take, you have to take it. You have to uh, consume it and understand that, you know, or try to understand it. But um, I'll tell you what, this is a, has been a really good time talking with you guys and just kind of hearing your story and and to be honest with you there's so much there i don't even know where to begin with a lot of this because it's just like wow like what do you say what do you say to somebody when they're like i talked to jesus like i saw him i talked to him it's like <laughs> you know what i mean it's like it's like what am i supposed to say like how tall is he like you know what yeah. i mean like, yeah. what do you come back with I yeah can't that. no it's I'm, it's it's like i'm a psychologist major and and it's still kind of unbelievable to me you know it's been three years three and a half years and it, it, it's still i'm still processing it and you know when people hear about my story, they're like, even, even people that are, are so-called Christians, you can see it in their face. Like, yeah, whatever, you know, <laughs> sure. You went to heaven. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, so. I, I'll tell you, I, I understand that in a sense where, you know, even, even me, I mean, I went through a phase where when I was in church and I started coming out and talking about the things that I'm into with the paranormal, supernatural, all that stuff, cryptozoology. Um, and people, there are people at the church that kind of looked at me sideways. They're like, what, what are you, what are you doing? Like what? Like the one, the one guy, I remember this distinctly uh, because it, it really ticked me off. <laughs> I, was, I was standing around some people and we're all talking and we're talking about, I think it was a topic of Bigfoot or something. And it was just a good lighthearted conversation. And, um, this this kid comes over and he was uh, leading church worship that day. They just got done practicing and he sits down at our table and he's just sitting there listening. And then he kind of stops, interrupts me and stops me. And he's like, wait, you believe in Bigfoot? And I looked at him and he was probably like 20 years old, around that, 21. And I was like 30 something. And I, it was like one of those moments where you just everything freezes around you 
and a million thoughts run through your head at one time. And I looked at him and I just was like, yeah, yeah, I believe in Bigfoot. And that's what I said. But what I wanted to say was, <laughs> you snot-nosed punk kid, don't come over here to me and try to talk down to me when you're standing in the middle of a church where you're about to worship a God you never laid eyes on. And the only reason yes. why you believe him is because you read about him in a book and you say you feel him in your heart. And I'm crazy because people say they see a giant, hairy monster walking around the woods. Come right. on now. But I yeah. didn't. I just let it go. So, <laughs> you, you know, um, the whole thing about B Bigfoot, you know, after seeing the spirit world that I've seen, you know, there's not many people that have seen Bigfoot. There's not many uh, re remain like remains and stuff. It kind of makes me think maybe Bigfoot is in the spirit world. You know, and that's why you don't see them yeah. all the time, you know, and yep. anything is possible in that spirit world. You know, bef yeah. before I would say Bigfoot, whatever. But now, man, there's every like um, people saying that they're seeing aliens. How do you know that it's not demons that you're seeing? Um I I don't know. It just opened my mind to different things, you know, because like I said, the spirit world is so much more real than this world, you know, and um, there's not many people that have seen Bigfoot and, uh, you know, who's well, to say that they're, but there has been. yeah, well, there's a lot of sightings of Bigfoot and stuff and, and things like that, but but compared Who's to the people, to, the amount of people that are in the world, not a lot of people have seen Bigfoot, you know? like Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and maybe uh, he's he's a spirit, you know, from yeah. another dimension or something, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, it's like, we don't know, but there are people who have described things that they, with, revolving around Bigfoot that doesn't seem normal. Like yeah. normal, like obviously a giant hairy monkey running around the woods isn't normal for North America. At least we don't think it is, but um, it, like paranormal type things. And so if these things are doing that stuff, then there is definitely something more to it than just this physical realm. And, you know, you said that when you were there, whether it was hell or heaven, it just, the spiritual realm felt more real than this realm. Uh that is, that's hard to fathom. And see, I think that's what's kind of throwing me off here with you is that the things you're telling me are things that I, my brain just can't comprehend. Like the, the idea that a spiritual realm, a, a, another realm after this one is more real than this one, knowing that the only real I have ever felt was this realm, I can't even fathom what you felt and how how you felt and what you're even talking about you know what i mean like the idea of it being more real is just like wow i i can't i don't even know what that would feel like you know yeah when i was in heaven like i've got scoliosis and my back always hurts and but when i was in heaven there was no pain um i felt like i could run a marathon I mean, it was just, I felt great, great. And it's the same way in hell. It, it's um, like, like I said, those people being tortured, they're feeling it 100 more times than like, if you get burned here on earth, it, it's there, there, it's, it's even more worse. You told me, he's told me before that, it's like the senses we have here on earth are heightened like a hundred times. Yeah. Like seeing, feeling, hearing, everything is more. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess that would, uh, that would make sense in the sense that you're in a whole new reality that's supposed to be, uh, more pure and perfect than this one. Right. I mean, uh, it's, you know, we're living in a flawed reality. Uh, but, I'll tell you what, this has been a great conversation. It's been 
very enjoyable for me to just sit here and listen to um, not only the experience itself, but the the post experience of just going and learning to live life again in a different way than you once did, especially remembering that you were able to do certain things that you just can't do now. Um, it, it's been a, a, a good time sitting here and just hearing your story. Do you have any plans on making your story uh, more part of your life when it comes to like telling people? Do you plan on hopefully maybe one day traveling and telling people about your story or kind of like starting your up your own kind of ministry again? Because I know you were in the ministry before. Is there any plans like that for you? Or are you trying to just kind of be low key, live your life and uh, just tell people when they cross your path? It's crazy because there's there's a lot of people, a lot of pastors that know my story, but I haven't been invited to many churches at all because I think a lot of people, like I said, in church, they don't want to hear the reality. And um, I'm, I'm, uh, We've been to a few churches. I've been to a few churches to give my testimony. Um, one of them was in Maryland, and um, there were a couple here in Tennessee that had me come over and share my testimony. But uh, there's a lot of churches. Um, me being an assistant pastor before, you know, there's a lot of people that know my story, but we haven't got called to share our testimony very much. Um, it just takes me back to, uh, Jesus, you know, he wasn't accepted in his own town pretty much. Um, so maybe we just need to go abroad, but, um, we, uh, sh shortly after I got out of the hospital and we were out, uh, eating and, um, we had, um, a uh, lady come up and started uh, prophesying over me and that I'm going to go around the world and preach the gospel. And uh, she didn't know anything about me. She didn't know that I used to, used to preach the word. Um, she didn't even know what happened to you. Yeah. She didn't even know that what happened to me. We were just in a restaurant and she, the Holy Spirit put on her heart to come over and tell me that um, I'm going to be a huge evangelist. And uh, that was prophesied over me a couple times before this whole thing happened with me. And, um, you know, it's um, I'm I'm wanting to start my book. I'm wanting to write a book about it and get the word out there um not not to be famous but to just to share what happened to share what happened and you know when when i seen those people falling in the lake of fire i knew that they didn't have a relationship with jesus so the most important thing in my life right now is to share my story and hopefully somebody out there will hear and just open the Bible and start reading and just, you know, pray. It, it, people think that uh, you got to do all this stuff, but it, it's um, all you got to do is talk to him. All he wants you to do is just have a relationship with him. Talk to him. He's a, like he's a regular person. And, uh, you know, uh, well, I mean, he's not a regular, <laughs> not, well, you know, he, he's as regular as a God can be. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and, uh, I'm wanting to write, write a book about it to get the word out there because there's people right now dying and going to hell. And that's what really bothers me. Um, you know, there's so many fake pastors out there and, you know, they're all about the money and the, and the fame and all that stuff. All I want is to um, 
Yeah, they don't go to hell. Yeah, make sure that they don't go to hell. Mm-hmm. I can't save their soul, but I can bring them to Jesus, you know, and um, that's that's my mission, you know. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, I've said this before on the show a lot of times, and, you know, it is what it is. I, I say it because I believe it. Uh, in America, it's different than across the world. And in America... Uh, Christianity has been de-supernaturalized and uh, most Christians do not in this country believe uh, the depths of the reality of the supernatural when it comes to the book that they say they believe. And so um, it doesn't surprise me that you're not getting a ton of invites. I think that could turn at any moment. I think that culture dictates a lot of the church and the church should be dictating culture. Uh, and so if the culture changes around the church, chances are the church will change. And maybe, you know, one day you'll get more invites because the culture changed. Um, and, uh, I, I would say that, um, uh, you're doing what you need to do. You, you, whether it's writing a book, and I know it's not to be famous. It's it's to it just share your story, um, and you know you're sharing your story on this show. It's a you know a sizable show, and I think that's a good thing. And so um, you you said that the whole reason you were sent back was that Jesus told you that you were to tell, basically tell the world, tell people that he's coming back soon, right? Yeah, and there is consequences if they don't believe in him. Okay. Well, you have done that on this show. And, uh, you know, when I guess my parting question, which probably isn't the best closing question, but uh, when he tells you this, did you ever get a feeling of how soon? Do you ever feel like this is something that soon as in your lifetime or do you think soon as in you know soon ish uh, i don't know um nobody knows what you know when he's going to come back um uh, but what did you feel when he told you that i've never even asked you that <laughs> when he said soon i'm i'm believing you know, not, not within five years or 10 years, probably, but within my lifetime. Okay. Um, because all you got to do is look around the world and see what's happening. And, you know, the scripture says, uh, when you see these signs, it's getting close and every year it gets closer and closer. And, um, like I said, in, in heaven, like there's no time, there's no time. And it's like, when he said, I'm coming back soon, you never know, you know, is it five years or 10 years? Because there's no years up there, you know, (laughs) and that blows my mind also, you know, it's, uh, you can be dead for 30 years and it might seem, like 30 seconds i you know i have no idea but um right. he just told me that he's coming back soon and what i'm ta- taking it as i better get prepared and i better share the share what i experienced because i don't want those souls on to me you don't you, want their blood on your yeah hands. you don't want i don't want their blood on my hands and if the holy spirit puts it in my heart to share my story or share the gospel, I better share it because I know the consequences now. I've seen them face, you know, face to face, you know, and uh, he takes that stuff serious. And, um, you know, the Holy Spirit, man, it's, um, I think there's a lot of people out there in the earth right now that the Holy Spirit is speaking to so many people, but they're ignoring it. They don't want to listen to it. I believe they know who's speaking to them, but they don't want to, like my friend that has, you know, went away from Jesus. Um, There's so many people that are not ready yet. 
and they better get ready because like I said, you never know when you're going to die. I didn't think that I would die so early in my life. Um, and, um, you know, you could go out there today and get a, in a car wreck and die. And, or eat from Subway. And, or eat from <laughs> Subway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I mean, uh, <laughs> that's funny. Well, Jason, I mean, if you ever, if you ever do uh, make it to a formal funeral, a normal, a normal funeral for people, they'll say, well, he died twice. Yep. We think you got any surprises for us, Jason, before we we put you six feet deep because you you surprised us once before. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so you know we we can't we can't ever count Jason out. That's for sure. (laughs) Yeah. So, but I'll I'll tell you, um, this this whole thing happened in December of 2016, right? Yes. What day do you remember? Um, December 11th is the day he actually died. Okay. So December 11th, 2016 on January 19th, 2017, I started my first podcast episode for the confessionals. So maybe this was a little bit of a divine appointment, you know, that a month later my podcast started and, uh, here we are three years later and you're on the show to share, an experience that you feel you're supposed to share with the world. And that happened a month before I launched my podcast. I was in the planning stages when, when that's, this happened to you, like the, I started planning this show in October of 2016 and I finally launched it in January. So, uh, this was in the works. And so when Jesus told you, uh, to tell people that he was coming back soon, he knew I was in the, in the process at that moment, preparing that's the right. show. And so, and you know, I want to say something, Tony. I have heard you say before how um, you used to think that you were going to be a pastor or a preacher, and that's where you were headed when you know you took a different turn. But I still believe that you are. I just think that you have a different ministry than you know a normal regular pastor does because you just by listening and helping people share their stories and you know, the things that you believe in, you are sharing God in in a way you, you are, that's your ministry. And that's what I believe God has called you to do. Well, I I appreciate that. And I, I I don't think um, I would have ever cut it to be a a pastor of a normal church. um, Because if you call me at three o'clock in the morning, tell me your goldfish died, I'm going to say, don't ever call me again. And so, (laughs) 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 but uh, (laughs) I I do, I do appreciate it. And, you know, the difference is uh, people show up to church on Sunday to hear about God. And so they don't yell at the pastor for talking about God. People yell at me for talking about God, so <laughs> I get the I get the emails and stuff. But uh, you know, it's one of those things where I I I allow guests on the show to be true to who they are and be themselves on the show, whether they believe in God, whether they don't believe in God, uh, whatever. You know, we've had we've had Wiccans on the show, we've had Satanists on the show. Um, it, it, I've talked. I'll talk to anybody. Um, and, and see, you reach people that most regular normal people or churches are not going to reach. Right. Exactly. And I I just, because I talk to anybody and let people say whatever they believe and how they feel on my show, I just ask for the same courtesy when your host feels free to feel free to share whatever he feels and stuff. And, um, you know, it is, it is what it is. I, I, uh, I enjoy what I do. I enjoy talking to lots of different people from all, you know, areas of life. It's something that uh, my entire life growing up, I've been pretty good at when it came to just, I didn't care who I was talking to. I usually was pretty good at finding something to talk to them about. And so uh, this open format of a show where if you've had something paranormal or something like that happen to you, you come on and talk about it. I don't care who you are, if you're a doctor, a, a Satanist doctor or a, a preacher that you know works in the... Um, jungles of Africa. I don't care. Like I, I'm pretty sure I can hold a conversation with you. And so, um, I, I do appreciate that. And, uh, 
Well, I don't know what else to say other than thank you very much for sharing on the show. Oh, you're welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. I don't care how you share the show, but if you enjoy this show, please share it around because that's the best thing you could do to help the show grow because the algorithms are not going to let us share the show naturally, organically. So we need you, the listener, the people who actually enjoy the show to share it with other people so they can enjoy it as well. And just before I get out of here, I want to give everybody an update. Last week, I told you that my wife went into labor and she did go into labor. We had our baby girl, Gemma, and she is healthy. We had to take her back to the hospital because they wanted to put her in the NICU. She was a month early and all that stuff. I was a little nervous about it, but everything turned out good. She's back home now. Her weight is up. She's healthy. She's beautiful. Blue eyes. So she's going to have a tan skin, blue eyed girl. Woo! Boys back up because daddy's got a gun. All right. Until next week, friends, stay safe, take care. And remember, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off.